today on Ask This Old House. This fireplace is a work of art, but it's in tough shape, and restoring it is gonna be a challenge. If I break anything while I'm trying to extract, huge problem because we can't reproduce the brick, and the face of this fireplace will change forever. And this must be the swing. This is, we bought it, put it together, and then we couldn't figure out how to hang it. Well, I can say one thing, it's very important that you hang it into structure you don't want somebody falling and getting hurt. I'll show you how to hang a porch swing. And what is the right temperature to set your thermostat? Well, it depends. It's complicated. For projects around the house, HomeAdvisor helps find local pros to do the work. You can check ratings, read customer reviews, and book appointments with pros online at HomeAdvisor.com. HomeAdvisor is proud to support Ask This Old House. That's brilliant. Hey guys, what are we looking at? <gasps> oh no. How do you like that? A sick lawn. Yeah, this was in my and neighborhood. It, oh no. it had all these brown spots in it, and at first I couldn't figure out what it was. Wait, don't tell me yet. I want to guess. So I see brown grass. I think drought, although far too selective, right, with the green next door. So that can't be it. I was thinking animals, a large dog, but uh, that would be a pretty, pretty big large animal, dog. Yeah. How about uh, grubs? I always go with grubs. Oh, you and your grubs. Got to be time. grubs, right? What actually happened is the homeowner burnt the lawn. She took a herbicide that kills everything it touches. Oh no. So when she was spraying the weeds, she actually got it all over the grass. Grabbed too. the wrong bottle. She grabbed right. the wrong bottle. She could have used this one, which kills only the weeds and not the grass. I mean, these look almost identical, so you really have to pay attention. A mistake is costly, as we can see over there. We right. do have some options now that are organic. This particular one right here is citrus based, but this will kill grass and weeds. This is a selective one that's clove-based, and that'll take and kill just weeds, and the grass will still grow. So organic, Roger. People love organic. Yeah. Are they as effective as these? I found you have to repeat the use two or three times to get the same results as the other, but it's well worth it. Right. It's definitely worth it. A couple extra applications, and it's kid-friendly and pet-friendly. Nice. And in her case, damage has been done. What's yeah. her next step? Take an iron rake in a couple weeks and rake that up, put a little compost on it, mm. put some seed on it. Hope it comes up and blends right back in. Nice. All right, good. Doable. Good to know it wasn't crops. <laughs> <laughs>Hello. Hey. And welcome. How you doing, Bob? Great. Glad All you right. could make it. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. All right. You've got the great, big, beautiful Victorian house. I love it. It is. It's, it's wide hallways, yeah. tall ceilings, yeah. and the grand staircase. It's right. Neat. Yes. Big newel post. It's the first thing you see when you walk in. Exactly. The house was built in 1894. 1894. Wow. Yeah. Big doorways. Yes. Got ceilings. Yeah. And all the Victorian trim you could want, right? And look what we've got here. A fireplace. It's a, a beautiful old fireplace. I've never seen one like this before. Right. But as you can see, there's some issues with it. And I'm so glad you're able to take a look at it for us. All right. Well, our pleasure right off the bat, because I don't know if you know it, but this is a gem. You don't walk into, you know, many houses where you actually have a fireplace with this much detail. For instance, Bob, look at this. This is what we call a chevron brick. I don't want to say it's one of a kind, but I haven't seen one yet, only in books. Going up, this is what we call an egg and dart detail. You can see how beautiful that is. But look above at the woodwork. See how they tried to tie it all together? Unfortunately, I can also see the settlement pattern. Uh, this brick is tipping to the left, so I know that there's a problem somewhere in this area. It's a risky job, Bob. Most of the material that we're gonna be working with is one of a kind, so irreplaceable, if you will. The main risk that we're gonna be dealing with today is when I extract this brick very carefully now, that I'm gonna hope that none of these brick are broken or I don't break them during the extraction. If I do, huge problem because we can't reproduce the brick and the face of this fireplace will change forever. Well, I'm willing to take the risk. It's a beautiful fireplace. I'd love to see it restored. Okay, glad to hear it because I'm up for the task. The only thing I do want to do is get to the basement and make sure we don't have any real structural damage that'll affect what we do. Okay, let's take a look. All right, Bob. So the hearth is right here. Oh yeah, okay. All right, the old barrel arch, which I love, very strong. I can see that this one's been patched, which is fine. 
Um, and look at this post. I wonder if this is built for support or anything, although I do see some evidence yeah. uh, of other posts. So maybe this was a coal room or something Could back in the day. Room. Yes. Yep. But the foundation, now this is one of the old stone foundations and under this stucco coat is individual stones that they probably took right out of this hole and mm -hmm. stacked up as the foundation. So I see a lot of cracking here, which may indicate that some of these stones on the corner walked away, which would be responsible for the settling. But uh, everything in a general sense looks pretty good to me. So I bet you when we fix this fireplace, you're not gonna have any more problem with the uh, settlement. That's so. good news. So, but always good to check it out. Yes. I'm glad we came yeah. down. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take this masonite, which is just bendy compressed wood material. So when I'm working on these top brick, the arch doesn't fall. And these two by fours are actually gonna help me condense the shape of the mason ups, masonite so it's tight against the brick. One side. Yeah, that's gonna work great. In terms of my tools, I'm gonna go a little unconventional. These are just margin trowels and flat joiners, but they're the only thing that's thin enough for me to actually get in and extract the mortar. So what would be a conventional tool? Conventional tool is a chisel, but as you know, the chisel gets a wide head and that'll chip the brick, which is the opposite of what we're trying to do. So now I'm just gonna tap this brick up and hopefully I break that bond right there and I'm able to slip the brick out. Wow, that's yep, fast. That went pretty well. Now I'll just take a little mortar from the bottom. Look at that. Perfect. Wow. See all that, Bob? That is handwork. Wow. <laughs> Just a mason and his chisel. No saws, no diamond yeah. blades. Look at the modifications he had to make. Amazing. Look at that's just the back of his hammer. So he's gnawing at this, knowing that he can hit the face. Very talented guy who laid this, so good sign. But look at all this. Is that the old mortar that's in there? This is the old mortar, and it's in the condition that we were hoping. It's crumbled, it's loose. So when this settled, it must have crumbled, which again is gonna make for a very easy extraction, which is what we were hoping for, yeah. This went so well that I think I'm just gonna be able to tap, break the bond, yep. scrape and scratch. And there it is. Looked like the bottom one came loose as well. Yeah, which is again, what we were hoping for. That is great. This brick here, even with my hand, just a little tap. And we're definitely gonna wanna save this brick. But look at that, more of the same characteristics of the brick hammer. The same colored mortar, and look, look at the thinness of the... So, Bob, you see how thin that is, right? Imagine with a hammer, tap, 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 tap. And just through experience, I lose that piece three out of four times. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really a hard cut. Now we can go after the remaining brick, but only in the areas that were damaged by settling. I want to keep as much of the fireplace intact as possible. And no imperfections, which means the guy that hammered this piece together really knew what he was doing. So Bob, one of the big problems that we have when we're trying to restore a fireplace like this is the joints. Can you see how thin that is? Yes. Normal joints for us are about 3 eighths of an inch. You can see that's a lot less. So what we do do is we end up using the same material. Okay, this is type N mortar. All it is is Portland cement and lime mixed together. That's what gives us, gives us our type N. And this is the sand that we would usually use with the type N. As you can see, that aggregate is pretty big. That's just gonna be way too big for it to fit down and keep those joints as tight as we have them. So what we're gonna use is what we call a restoration sand. Now look at that. See how it's very, yeah, fine? very fine? That's gonna allow us to get all our mortar in between the brick. So all we have to do now is get started with the mix. The proportions are one scoop of mortar to three scoops of sand. Mm. 
because the original mortar was red, we're going to add a red dye to the mix as well. I'm looking for is just that one consistent color of red. Don't forget we're going to do every single joint on the fireplace so consistency is key. You can see I'm using my tool to even press down. That way I'm just going to make sure that the brick is full from front to back. We're going to grind out all the joints. That way we'll have color uniformity. This is incredible. Look at the job. It, I didn't think you could bring it back to this extent. It's almost perfect. All right, well, thanks, Bob. As you know, we did get lucky. We thought those chevron brick may have been tied into the other existing masonry. Turned out that it wasn't. We got lucky. I, I love the way the results came out, so. Well, I, I think it's an awful lot more than luck, Mark. The well, skill that you brought to this <laughs> and the way you brought it back to life, I'm, I'm impressed. Well, thanks for having me in, Bob. You're very welcome. All right. Just the fellas I wanted hey, to yeah. see. Question comes to us from John in Flemington, New Jersey, and he says, what is the perfect temperature to set the thermostat at in this house. And I told him, well, that's easy. 68 for me, 72 for my wife. Oh. Done. <laughs> Is it summer or winter? Uh, well, he didn't say. Is it a what? forced air system or hydronic system? Well, he didn't tell me that either. How much humidity? Come on, wait a second. He didn't tell me any of this air stuff. Airspeed. Are you guys being difficult or what? Why can't Look, you just give me a number? We, we get this question all the time and it invites a whole much longer conversation. Most people, if you ask them, what, are you comfortable They'll say, I don't know, let me check the thermostat. And they look at a number. Mm. But there are four factors that go into making people comfortable. One is temperature. Right. The second one is humidity, right? It's often overlooked. If you have too little humidity, it's dry in that space, it's gonna be uncomfortable. If you have too much humidity, it's gonna be moist. It's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be uncomfortable. So the balancing act is trying to figure out what the right humidity is for that space. So are you suggesting that 68 degrees doesn't feel like 68 degrees all of the time? 68 degrees in the winter, when it's, the air is usually drier, like say it's 20% relative to humidity, you're going to feel cold. But if that humidity, say you added a humidifier and you got it up to 30 or 40%, hmm. you that might feel comfortable at 68. If you didn't add humidity, you might have to go to 72. 72. Yep. All right. All right. So now what the else other are you worry thing about? is the type of heating system. In America, 90% of the heating systems are hot air. Right. And so with that, you're moving air through a duct. And if you blow that air across people, it evaporates your, the, the moisture on your skin and you can feel colder. So air velocity, you think it's really great, you know, oh, let's feel that warm air. But that air blowing across you can make you feel less comfortable and that means you have, might have to raise the air temperature higher. Yeah. And so, but then, and you know what happens all the time? People, the thermostat shuts off on an air system and the thermostat says 70, but you're freezing. Yeah. It, it's called cold 70, because right. you just stopped having that air, that warm air right. go across. The whole system shut down. Right. Right. Yep. And there's one more factor, which is mean radiant temperature. Oh, man, you guys are making this Stop, <laughs> stop. <laughs> so, so mean radiant temperature. Our skin is 74 degrees approximately. We were 98.6 and we're healthy, but 74 at our skin. So it, to be comfortable, if I stand near a surface that is colder than me, heat will pull from me and go this way and I'll feel colder. Even though the room's temperature is Absolutely. exactly the same. So you know when you stand near a window in the cold in the winter, you'll start feeling colder. And right. it, uh, conversely, inversely, if you stand near a radiator, it's gonna feel warmer. So the higher you can get the mean radiant temperature, the more surfaces in a building that are warm, like radiant floor heating hmm. or a radiator, you'll feel comfortable. And the way to understand this is freezing cold winter day, you're out there shivering, but you step out, out from the shade and all of a sudden, the mean radiant temperature increases because that sun's energy comes down. Right. The temperature in the thermostat, if you had one, wouldn't have changed. It still would have been the same number. Same Damn. example, campfire, right? 
campfire, you go right by the campfire, that same radiant temperature that, that he's talking about right. makes you feel a higher mean radiant temperature, increases right. your comfort. Right. So, so do I get away from all of this complexity if I just get myself a smarter thermostat? I mean, well, can, it, can it solve all those problems for well, me? Well, it'll help. It'll help. You know, most people don't want to spend too much. They don't want to replace all their equipment, so they start with the thermostat. Now, the thermostat has been a simple device for many years. It just says on or off. It says I'm cold, turn it on. And it brings on the furnace or the boiler to full blast. And usually that furnace or boiler has been oversized by the original installer, mm -hmm. so it races, okay? And now, many times, it's just a single zone system. So the idea was to do setback, reduce the temperature. So you can do it manually by turning it back when you right. leave. This is the standard clock thermostat. I want the temperature to sort of go down after I leave the house, stay off during the day, right. come right. back before dinner right. time in the winter, warm me up. And the fact is, 50% of the ones that got onto the wall never got programmed. Still Come flash on. 12 midnight like the old VCRs used to do. Really? And, absolutely, absolutely. And nobody's schedule right. is always the same, right. right? So if you do them, you know, Monday through Friday scheduling, right. set it back at nine. What if you're staying home that day? Heaven help you if you're home sick. You have to, oh, I gotta reprogram it. So the smart thermostats changed everything. So these are the thermostats where they're connected basically to your phone, and now I can do the programming here. Right, right. Is it not just a fancy programmable thermostat though? Well, the difference is with this thermostat, it's easy to use. Right, so you actually have a fighting chance of getting your program correctly. These also have motion sensors. They can track motion through the house so that they're turning on the system when you're there yeah. versus mm -hmm. when you're not there, right? So if I stay home sick, yep. it sees me moving back and forth and says, oh, I should have been setting back, but he's home. Right, and they've advanced, <laughs> they've advanced even, you know, do a thing called geofencing. So by the GPS in your phone, it knows where you are in proximity to your house, so, so it knows if fine. you've gone farther away. If I'm driving home from work, it knows I'm approaching, and then it yeah. tells the house to start warming it fires up. It up. That's right. Interesting. And where it's going from there is now to wireless sensors. So these can be strategically located around your house, and they even have motion. So it's only going to sense the rooms that you're in to provide the comfort where you are actually in the house. So this is not a thermostat, but it talks to the it thermostat? It can communicate, yeah. Right. So this could be, in his example, this could be in the hallway. This could be your thermostat. But this sensor is in the living room yeah. where or the kitchen, wherever you're spending most of the time. Right. But can't have a conversation with anybody about saving energy without looking at telling people, look, you got a system that's been in there for 50 years. It's probably 50% efficient, maybe 60% efficient. You do a lot better than Change that. Change it. And what happens is the local utilities are often your partners. They want to help you with rebates. You know, the monthly payment also, oftentimes for the new equipment is, is uh, less money than you're going to save right. in terms of operating costs. All so. right. So I guess I got to get back to John and tell him. <laughs> Uh, hang on, no, yeah, I, this yeah, is what I'm going to tell him. <laughs> John, the answer is call the truth. <laughs> Good info, guys. Thank you. Hey, Brandon, how are you? Good, Tommy. Thanks for coming out. My pleasure. So I take it this is the porch you wrote me about? This is, and here's the view we want to take advantage of with the porch swing. It's a great view. And this is the swing. It is. You know, we bought it, we put it together, and then we couldn't figure out how to hang it. Well, hanging it is very important because you want to make sure that you hang it into structure. You don't want a part of this or all of it falling down and somebody getting hurt. Mm. All right, so the first thing I see is I see vinyl siding, vinyl shutters, and a vinyl ceiling. Yeah. Now, if this was a wood ceiling, I could take a real thin drill bit, drill through the ceiling and find the structure above it, and then we could mount the seat. The problem is the vinyl ceiling above that, there's actually a gap between the top part of the ceiling and the structure. So what we need to do is take some of the ceiling down, find the structure, and then add to it as we need it. All right, let's do it. Stand it up right here. All right, Brandon, now that the ceiling's down, let me show you what we have up here. This piece of two by six, the ceiling joist, is actually structure. The one by three strapping is actually a furring strip. And the furring strip is up there so that you can nail the ceiling to, but it's not structural. So now here's the bracket that comes with the swing. And you can see that it pivots back and forth here and two holes to screw the lag bolts into structure. But let me show you what we have right here. So if I hold the bracket so that the two holes line up with the structure to get the lag bolts in, look at the way that the bracket pivots. That puts the swing perpendicular to the house. We need to turn the bracket 90 degrees so that the swing will swing parallel to the house. 
Now here's the problem. We have one hole that we can get lag bolt into the structure and nothing into this hole, so we have to add structure above it. The other issue is this furring strip. That is needed so that we don't have this deflection in the vinyl. And it just so happens that this furring strip is a good distance off the house so we can utilize this one. But now I can screw through the furring strip into the structure, but remember, the one by three is not structural, so we have to add the structure above that. I'll just hammer this block in between the structure and attach it with wood screws. Then it'll do the same for the other side of the swing. Okay, this one in. Now we can reinstall the ceiling up to where we're going to install the bracket. I want to be able to see the structure when I drill through the vinyl so I go into the structure with the screws. I'll use a bigger drill bit just for the vinyl, then switch to a smaller one when drilling into the wood. So these are just lag screws that I'm going to hand tighten. I don't want them too tight when they get to the vinyl because the vinyl moves differently. We'll get this side on the spring, and then you can try it out. All right, moment of truth. Yep. How's it feel? That feels perfect. You look good in that. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for all your help. Now you have some place to hang out. <laughs> Thanks for watching. This old house has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.